This week, we welcome Rob Allen, Chief Product Officer at ThreatLocker, to discuss how to attain zero trust. In the leadership and communication segment, underfunding and leadership gaps weaken cybersecurity defenses, a self-care checklist for leaders, Senate Bill I's minimum cybersecurity standards for healthcare industry, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Let's talk about something that's becoming increasingly important for enterprise companies worldwide, cyber risk management. Traditionally, cyber risk has been managed manually in silos, separate from the business's core operations. The future is about getting real-time risk insights benchmarked against your industry peers through automation. And CyberSaint's CyberStrong platform is leading the charge. CyberStrong is not just another point solution. It's a revolutionary platform. It's a quantified top-down risk approach where your unique cyber risk informs C-suite decision-making to identify your top five cyber risks and the controls to mitigate them. Sign up for your free cyber risk analysis by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSaint. Your customers' and employees' identities are your responsibility to keep safe. But who is helping you stay safe from identity-based threats? Identity is the key to getting security right. And with the right identity partner, so much more is possible for your business than you thought. From strengthening cybersecurity, to increasing revenue, to reducing inefficiencies and costs, Okta unlocks growth and new possibilities for its customers. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash Okta to learn more about Okta and the company's commitment to leading the fight against identity attacks. If your organization is ready to enhance cyber resilience, we have important insights for you. The Level Blue Futures Report 2024 sheds light on how rapid computing changes affect IT visibility. Our research reveals that while IT leaders see positive outcomes, 85% acknowledge increased risk. In this report, we identify the barriers to cyber resilience, the challenges impacting cybersecurity, and the business context that reveal operational issues. You'll also discover what's on the horizon and five essential steps for prioritizing cyber resilience. Get your complimentary copy of this crucial research today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash level blue. Cybersecurity simplified. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 366, recorded September 30th, 2024. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this segment today is my co-host, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. Hey, Jason. Hey, how we doing, Matt? And if well, you crazy. Oh, well, go Yeah, ahead. better than my Browns. Better yeah, my Browns. <laughs> I mean, we got creamed by San Francisco, right? Cowboys got beat by the Giants. Broncos eked one out. Against the Jets by one, but uh, it was a crazy weekend. I mean, AFC has the Bills, Chiefs, Steelers, Texans all up top in their respective divisions, and we're looking at Commander, Seahawks, Vikings, and Bucks for the MSC. But uh, Chiefs and Vikings still undefeated. Yes, that happened. Yep, Chiefs playing well. They're they they're they're building a little dynasty down there. We might have hey, to hey, switch teams. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> they need to count to six first. <laughs> That's true. That's true. In case anybody's wondering, six Super Bowl rings. Anyways, um, this segment is sponsored by Threat Locker. To learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Threat Locker. Rob Allen is an IT professional with almost two decades of experience assisting small and medium enterprises embrace and utilize technology. He has spent the majority of of this time working for an Irish-based MSP, which has given invaluable insights into the challenges faced by MSPs and their customers today. Rob's background is technical, first as a system administrator, then as a technician and engineer. His broad technical knowledge, as well as his innate understanding of customer needs, made him a trusted advisor for hundreds of businesses across a wide variety of industries. Rob joined the Threat Locker team in 2020. One, excited at the prospect of building new relationships and helping deliver the ThreatLocker enterprise-level security products to customers throughout the EMEA region. Rob, 
Welcome to Business Security Weekly. Matt, that was a phenomenal introduction. I, I couldn't have written it better myself. Did you? Speak, or was that your marketing which, team? <laughs> no, well, speaking of which, I actually must throw that through ChatGPT shortly and see if it comes up with something better. Uh, and yeah, I'm also horrified to note that it is actually almost 30 years rather than 20 years. So yeah, I think it's time for an update. Yeah, he, uh, Jason and I resemble that remark. By we, we, we totally do. <laughs> all, although we're and by, by the way, all, we're... all that stuff you were talking about at the start, I, I, I recognize the individual words, but I had no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Amer- American football. Oh, you American mean American football. hand egg? Because yes, there's no hand egg. Fo- <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. Hand egg. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Now I'm glad we're clear. Now it all makes some kind of sense. Oh, uh, yeah. So some, we, we Americans, I'll leave it at that. All right, Rob, we're going to get into zero trust a little bit today. Now, zero trust has been a topic, hot topic for a while. Um, the federal government has mandates for agencies to be zero trust enabled. Uh, I, I've actually been working with some of the agencies on trying to validate zero trust in certain areas. Um, so I'm very familiar with the topic, but it's a topic that's not easily accomplished. And so I wanted to start a little bit with some of the challenges around zero trust attainment. Um, I think it's more about perceived challenges than actual challenges to some extent. Uh, one of the things that a lot of organizations will think is that, it, you know, if you're starting greenfield, you know, nothing in place, can we get up, set up with zero trust or towards zero trust? That It seems a pretty easy undertaking. If you're talking about an established organization, business, enterprise, whatever the case may be, and you've got lots of stuff in place already, People seem to think or people have a perception that this is way too difficult, it's way too hard, we're going to have to go back to square one and build from the ground up. And that, that's not the case. That's not the case. I mean, it's effectively the first step is a, case, uh, is a matter of figuring out what you have. And I know that sounds more difficult than it is, but it, it is just a case of figuring out what's there, how things are set up, what we're using, all that kind of stuff, and then basically working from that point and very often it's working backwards you know so it's okay we just discovered that we've got seven different remote access tools running in our machines okay well let's turn six of those remote access tools off so they can't be used so it's not a case of as i said necessarily working forwards in some cases it can also be working backwards as well well you just said a magic word Knowing what you have, that means we have to have good asset inventories. Oh, the age-old question of asset management and configuration management. Who would have thought, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, Rob. So, some of the challenges I think, you know, in obviously the majority of organizations are going to be up and established, right? The amount of greenfield is all net new companies, right? Your startups Absolutely. and things of like that. So, most organizations are going to fall into that space of we're already up, we're already established. A lot of the conversation that I'm hearing, and, and I can see why the, there'd be confusion, right? So you have government agencies like CISA and NIST who say they have zero trust frameworks. You have industry organizations like Cloud Security Alliance or the ISA, you know, the in- International Society of Automation, vendor space, Microsoft, Google, Palo. Then you have consulting firms like McKinsey and Deloitte. They all have their little flavor of zero trust. They all have their little framework. They align. There's overlap. But where do organizations start? What are the core concepts? Because it's evolved a little bit over time and everybody's putting their own little flavor on what zero trust actually means. Uh, absolutely. And I think, or uh, when I think about zero trust or what zero trust is, I actually think about the executive order that's already been mentioned a couple of times, which effectively mandated zero trust for basically anything to do with the federal government. And there was As part of the executive order, they literally defined what zero trust is. And there was a few parts of the definition that I found particularly uh, interesting or resonated, especially with me. One was effectively it said assume breach. So assume a breach is inevitable or has already likely occurred. So constantly limit access to only what is needed. I mean, that's a, a brilliant perspective to look at cybersecurity from anyway, irrespective of zero trust or any other buzzwords um but it effectively as as i said as part of that definition it basically defined what zero trust is and i think that's a really good place to start when you're working towards what it is you want to achieve now let me just clarify you just called an american brilliant did i (laughs) yeah you said it was a brilliant definition i think i've been misquoted 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it is actually, ge- genuinely, it is a brilliant definition. And to be honest, I, I think we may have discussed this briefly last week, but I, I think it is something more, or something that governments need to do. Uh, I mean, the in terms of, and I know it's a, a, a different conversation, but the um, the the legislation in the the in Australia rather, um, which is called the Essential Eight, it's a brilliant and really good starting place for organisations who are thinking, what do I need to do? Now in Australia, I know the uh, Essential Eight sounds really simple. It's eight things. It's actually loads more than eight things, but they're just called the Essential Eight so it wouldn't scare people off. Um, but you've got similar leg- legislation in Europe around data privacy, uh, GDPR. I mean, that that scared a lot of organizations into doing the right thing. And when you say to an organization, you could present, I, I think the, the GDPR fines were like up to 2% of worldwide revenue. If you say to somebody, if you don't take care of people's data, you're going to be fined 2% of your worldwide revenue. That's going to get people's attention pretty quickly. But again, it's not always about a stick. It's also about helping people. It's not necessarily about punishing people. It's about saying, well, hey, this is what you should be doing. And as I said, I think that um, that particular piece of legislation was extremely useful from that perspective. Yeah. And we've talked about this topic on the show before that zero trust is not a skew. It's not even five or six skews, right? There is some complexity to this. And in the conversations I've been having with some of the agencies, I mean, they're trying to validate literally a couple hundred security products around zero trust. That's how massive this can be. And so I think trying to figure out how to structure an approach is pretty important, right? You said, and I think brilliantly, I'm, I'm, I just, yeah, I just called you brilliant. Brilliantly, it starts with asset management. Like, what do you have, right? Because if you have seven remote access tools, why do I need seven? Maybe I only need one. Then I only have to deal with zero trust for one, not seven. That reduces the scope greatly. And and you could go across all the different technology stacks and have a very similar conversation because one of the things we've seen over the last couple of years, Rob, is kind of this consolidation of platforms, right? CISOs used to have, you know, somewhere between 50 and 75 tools on average, right? Do I need that many? Because if you're trying to validate zero trust across 50 to 75 tools, that's pretty darn complex. It's it's almost impossible. Oh, it's completely impossible. Absolutely. And again, multiply that by how many hundreds of pieces of software that are in use in an average organization. Um, you know, it, it, it comes down to patching, you know, vulnerabilities in each and every one of them. And again, vulnerabilities in software is a huge issue. Um, I mean, the way we try to communicate with people or what I say to people is, look, assume the software that you use every day right now is full of holes. Assume it's just a question of whether or not those holes are known about and are actively being targeted. So like we're again, we're on this podcast platform. I was told I had to use Chrome. How many serious vulnerabilities CVEs have there been in Chrome this year? I think at last last count, I think it was somewhere like nine and ten or nine or ten. Um, in all software, I mean the CVEs yearly. I think it's somewhere in the region about twenty one thousand on average, about twenty one thousand vulnerabilities a year. Uh, the more software you use, the more vulnerabilities that are there that are you know, possibly going to be exploited. So by minimizing what's in use, by standardizing what's in use as well, and I, you know, there's so many other positives from it. You know, the, there's the reduction in shadow IT. Uh, again, as an IT guy, I know what a pain it is to try and support you know, 15 different versions of whatever software it is or four different remote access, whatever the case may be. If you standardize, minimize, reduce, say, right, this is what we're using, um, it's just going to make the entire, I suppose, attack surface reduction um, much more attainable and achievable. Yeah, and that's the topic of this podcast, right, is how to make zero trust attainable. So if I know what I have, I reduce overlaps. Now I come up with a core set of solutions that I have to get tied together to work together. So where I want to go next is where does ThreatLocker play in that consolidated architecture? How can your platform help towards attainment of this concept of zero trust? So for the most part, we take a slightly different approach to the problem of cybersecurity to most other tools. Uh, Most other tools, effectively what they do is they permit by default and deny by exception. So they're effectively block listing is pretty much what all other tools do. Now, some of them do it in different ways. You've got, you know, definitions and signatures and things like antivirus. You've got, you know, behaviors and heuristics and, you know, that kind of stuff with something like an EDR. Um, 
not saying that there isn't a time and a place for those kind of approaches, uh, but we see it as being complementary to controls. And controls is very firmly where we live. So we have a platform, and again, it's interesting that you say about platforms and, you know, different tools in one because that is something that's really important because as you said you don't want to have to learn 50 different interfaces 50 different portals 50 different products effectively if you can do so much of it with one but we start with fundamentally allow listing so just allowing run what needs to run and blocking everything else not just bad things and that's a really important point because i mean i like ransomware attacks now don't even need to run ransomware and I know it sounds crazy, but realistically, all you need to perform a ransomware attack is AnyDesk, maybe PowerShell, um, WinRAR, we've seen used for file encryption and data exfiltration as well. WinRAR, I mean, that's not malicious. It's not something a EDO or a traditional uh, tool is going to block. But can it be misused? Absolutely. Um, and I've got to say something now, and I know you're both going to look at me like a dog that's been shown a card trick, okay? But we've seen instances of a tool called OrClone as in or, the letter or, clone. Now, for some reason, anytime I say that word to Americans, they go, huh? But trust me, or clone, if you see it in your environment, there's a fairly good chance that you have either been hit or in the process of being hit because it is the data exfiltration tool of choice of ransomware groups right now. But again, it's not malware. It's not bad software. It's not going to be stopped. But I suppose... And I, I'm conscious that I don't want to talk too much here, but what we also do is we take that principle, and our principle fundamentally is to deny by default, permit by exception, rather than permit by default, deny by exception. But we apply it to other areas. So what things can do when they're running, for example. So does PowerShell need to access my files? Or does um, WinRAR need to access the entire internet? That kind of stuff. So applying controls to applications and software prevents them from being weaponized, pretends, prevents them from being used against you. And we also have other... Same principle again, storage, so blocking things like USB drives, obviously, or storage devices, but also controlling which programs have access to what data. So just because something can run on your machine doesn't need to mean it needs access to your finance here or your management information. So again, restricting access to things can massively reduce the potential for damage if something bad either gets into an environment or even just the potential for data exfiltration. Um, we've Again, we can talk about network control as well. Uh, network connections and communications and being able to block them and allow them for when they are required is really, really important as well. Um, I had a great pleasure. So we run an event here in Florida every February called Zero Trust World. And by the way, Zero Trust World, what a name. Um, but I had the pleasure of talking to uh, a number of penetration testers at the event. And they said to me that their favorite thing to see on a network are printers. Because printers sit on networks for, you know, five, six, seven, sometimes 10 years, never patched, never updated. Most cases have the same default username and password that every other printer out in the world does. And they love them. They're a honeypot. They're a goldmine for a pen tester. But if it's a goldmine for a pen tester, it's a, it's a goldmine for a, an attacker as well. So again, think about all those, those devices we've got on our networks. I mean, I, I used to joke about my network at home and the fact that my oven was on my network at home and that I'd never patched my oven. It's got 10 times worse. I've just installed a fridge on my home network alongside my computer, yeah, my computer, my work machine, everything. Uh, I mean, there was a great example of a, um, a cyber attack on, not the big cyber attack recently, on a casino that came from a, and this is not a joke, a, a, oh God, try again. Sorry, it came from a smart heater in a fish tank. Now, why does a smart heater in a fish tank need to connect to anything important on your network? It just doesn't. So again, denying by default, only allowing network communication that needs to happen to happen is going to, again, massively reduce the potential for damage or something. Yeah. So, Rob, I mean, you, 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 t you talked a lot about knowing the assets, right? Because that's going to be very important to have your tool in play. But something else that's going to be important as well is being able to know the personality of the network, being able to baseline that network, right? So part of onboarding ThreatLocker, are there activities that you're doing with your clients to make sure you're baselining the network traffic? Because deny by default can be dangerous. Deny by default can be disruptive. Deny by default could shut a business down. And you don't ever want to do that, right? So talk to me about what onboarding looks like and baselining and making sure that 
you know the temperature and the personality of that that network and that architecture. So that way you're implementing in a safe way. So, yeah, I mean, basically, as you said, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, it is easy to break things. And look, we have no interest in customers breaking things with our solution because it's not in their interest. It's not in our interest. I mean, the first and probably most important part of it, even from an allow listing perspective as well, is just logging, logging information, logging data, seeing what's happening, you know, everything that's running, everything that's not able to run, all, all that kind of information is logged. But equally from a networking perspective, we're going to log all network traffic. So we're, we're going to see which devices are connecting to servers for example, basically build a picture of the environment before you ever get to the point where you secure it and lock it down. So you need to be able to see what's there, what's happening, what things are look like, uh, you know, should this device have this? And it, it's, you'd be amazed at how obvious it is. You know what I mean? You see a server with incoming connections in 1433, you know, oh, that's a SQL server. Okay, so we need to allow our devices in this group connect to that SQL server. But you, it, again, it starts with visibility. It starts with seeing what's there, what's happening, what's going on, and then working backwards from that to build policies. Now, we do the majority of it automatically, I should say, from a allow listing perspective, certainly. I mean, there's no heavy lifting involved. You don't have to figure out everything that needs to run in your machines. We're going to see all of those things running in your machines, and we're going to create policies based on that visibility or based on that information. Um, but networking is, our network control is not dissimilar. It's just about seeing what's there and building policies from that expected behavior. So it, to build the policy do you monitor the environment for a period of time to see what normal looks like, build those policies, and then enforce those policies? That's okay. pretty much the the, the standard um, the standard run book. Now, it, look, it, it happens not immediately. I mean, basically, we need time to see what's there. We need time to learn and create those policies. When I say time, though, I mean, you're talking about a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks in even complex environments. Um, what we do in terms of onboarding is we do weekly calls with customers. So we deploy an agent, leave it out in the machines, let it build policies, let it learn, let it catalog everything that's there. And we jump on a call. One of our solutions engineer jumps on a call about a week later. And we just go through what's been found, what's been learned. Look, these are the policies. Did you know these things? And the one thing that's absolutely brilliant with these calls is there is always surprises. There is always things running on machines that people had no idea was there. You, I, it, it's invariably. I mean, whether it be you know Minecraft running on a machine or you know Chinese coupon clippers running somewhere, there's always eye openers, and there's always things that people go, "I need that shut down right now." And again, we can do that by just changing a policy from a permit to a deny. It's a really simple, uh, trivial task. But we basically repeat that process over a period of time, so maybe three or four weeks. Now, again, it's not three or four weeks of work. It's like an hour's work over spread out over three or four weeks or an hour i should say a week over three or four weeks but at the end of that basically you'll get to the point where you can see everything that has been learned you can see all of the policies that have been created and then you can see as well everything that would be denied or would be blocked if it was turned on so then you can make a decision and say right are we satisfied we happy with this okay the only things that are going to get blocked are things that we don't want to run anyway Okay, so turn it on. And generally speaking, in most environments, for most in customer, for most customers, what they hear at that point is crickets, because most users do the same things with the same software every single day. You know what I mean? They use probably Office in ninety nine ninety nine times out of one hundred. They'll use browsers, you know, Chrome. Um, edge they'll use video conferencing tools you know teams and zoom maybe a line of business application or two you know maybe realistically outside of that what do most users need or what do most users use and the answer is not a whole lot um, and as long as they stay uh, fundamentally all we're doing is we're setting guardrails around that we're saying right if you operate within these guardrails you're not even going to know we're here now, if you go trying to download a random, you know, extraction utility or Chrome extension or remote access tool, then absolutely we're going to stop that. But that's what you want. That is the object of the exercise. So then what do exceptions or changes to the policy look like? Let's say I'm an end user. I need access to this thing. Is it an automated kind of, hey, request and it gets reviewed or how, how does that exception process work? 
So effectively, it's an approval process. So a user tries to run something, it gets blocked. They get presented with an opportunity to request permission. So can I run this, please? At that point, when they do that, we actually give them information about what the thing they're trying to run is. So we have a product research department, basically, and their unenviable task is basically to research every piece of software there is. Um, so if it is a remote access tool, if it is an encryption utility, we'll say, well, look, this is WinRAR. It's made in these countries. It can be used for this. It would have access to that. Do you want to or do you want to request it? So it's about giving information to the user to help them make an educated decision about whether they want to ask it. So like somebody tries to run 7-zip and it pops up and says, this software is made in Russia. A lot of people will go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't try to run that after all. Uh, but then once it comes through to the administrator, it's a really smooth, really quick, really easy approval process. Basically, they just evaluate it. They you know, approve it or deny it, and within 60 seconds, it's able to run on a machine. And even the evaluation part, we make it really easy because we actually provide a VDI, a sandbox, where you can run software to make sure it behaves properly, to make sure it is what it says it is, to make sure it doesn't kick off alarms on virus total. And again, it's not always about the first thing that runs because the first thing that runs might be fine, but then it's going to be installing DLLs and, you know, potentially batch files and PowerShell scripts and all manner of stuff in the machine. Are they all good? Are they all what they say they are? Um, so the, the testing environment allows customers to, as I said, basically detonate software, make sure it behaves itself. Is it okay? Should the user have it? Say yes. And within 30, sorry, within 60 seconds, they can run that software. Yeah, because it's always the exception handling process, right? It's always an exception. <laughs> yeah, and, and and to be honest with you, I mean, so much of zero trust is based on identity as well, right? It's it's the it's the trust but verify, and, and at the end of the day, you're verifying everything. You're you're making sure that a certain identity isn't running tools. I counter. It's not trust but verify. It is in fact the exact opposite of trust but verify. I mean, trust but verify is what antivirus has been doing for twenty years. Trust but verify is what EDRs do today. They let everything happen unless they know it to be bad. Now, if trust but verify worked, there would be no such thing as ransomware. There would be no data breaches. There would be. I mean, cybersecurity might be a thing, but it wouldn't be as much of a thing because it would be a solved problem. It's not a solved problem. So it's it's the opposite of trust but verify, really. Yeah, it's, it's, it's verify. It's 100% yeah, verify, right? Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> deny <laughs> and verify. <laughs> yes, at, perfect, perfect. Deny, then so, verify. Somebody called, was, was that Ronald Reagan? Somebody called Ronnie up and said, tell him it's not trust but verify, right? Right, 100% <laughs> verify. But at that point, you're able to see what every identity is trying to do. And you can stop it in its tracks at that point, right? That, that was the point I was trying to make is that you have an identity trying to leverage a tool, and now you have a stop gap in the middle, right? You have that stop gap in the middle. Yeah. We've, I've seen so many examples of this. Uh, I mean, we had a, uh, I was working with the, it was actually the company I used to work for back home in Ireland, but they deployed it to some of the biggest customers. They basically turned it on and were expecting a deluge of tickets. Now, as it turned out, they got basically, I think, three tickets over the course of a week. One was a user trying to run some game or other. It wasn't Minecraft. It was something similar. Roblox. Yeah, somebody trying to run Roblox on a work computer and wondering why it was getting blocked. But an interesting one was they got a request through from the receptionist in one of their customers. It was an accounting, very large accounting firm back home in Ireland. I was trying to run a IP scanner, advanced IP scanner. Now, it sort of set off alarm bells. It was like, well, why is this receptionist trying to run advanced IP scanner? It just didn't add up. So they rang the user and said, hey, why are you trying to run this? Turns out it wasn't a receptionist at all. It was some third party who was trying to fix their phone system who wanted to install advanced IP scanner on her computer. A third party, nothing to do with the organization, no good reason for it to be there, only for, you know, this random phone system dude decided he wanted to install in the machine. But the problem with things like that is once it gets installed, it sits there forever as a potential way into that network. I mean, another example, I've worked with a company in the UK who had, and the, the example of seven, I, or sorry, seven remote access tools actually came from these guys in that they literally had seven different remote access tools running, running. I, I hasten to add, not just sitting around running on their computers, including 20% of the machines running TeamViewer, an application or a piece of software that that organization did not use. Okay, their, their support did not use it. Their, nothing to do with that organization said they should be using TeamViewer. Team <laughs> Yet it was running on 20% of the machines. And look, I've been an IT guy long enough to know how it happens. You know, at some 
random point in the distant past, some third party said, I need to get in to fix that software on your machine. Would you just install TeamViewer for me? And again, it sits there forever as a potential way into that network. I mean, one of my favorite, and I know favorite is a terrible word to use in such serious um, situations or circumstances, but one of my favorite cyber attacks of the last few years was one on a water treatment facility. I think it was here in Florida, actually. It was. Yeah, I was going to bring it, it up. It was a team viewer. It, yeah. it was described as an advanced cyber attack. Right. And basically it was some guy was sitting at his desk. Now, I always p picture Homer Simpson when I'm picturing this, but some guy was sitting at his desk and he noticed that the levels of chemicals in the water were being adjusted in front of him. Now, I think he basically called somebody, said there's weird stuff going on here. But anyway, long story short, in the end, it turned out it was just TeamViewer. And you can be guaranteed that that team viewer installed in that computer was installed by some random third party at some point in the past, and it sat there on his machine. And he probably opened up team viewer one day and it said, sign in. And he, he tried to sign in and he couldn't. He, oh, God, I better set up an account. So he may set up an account with a, you know, his personal email address and password. Probably the same password he uses on 15 other websites. And then one of those 15 other websites gets compromised. And then all of a sudden it's into the water treatment facility. We go and let's play with chemicals. So, yeah, as I said, it's a terrible way to describe a cyber attack, but it, just the fact that it was described as an advanced cyber attack when realistically it was just some some dude had team viewer on his computer. Yeah, well, we've, we've had lots of advanced terminology over the years that aren't super advanced or sophisticated. So, Rob, just quickly, when I think about it, right, five core, some say six core domains to zero trust, right? You've got identity, endpoint, applications, data, uh, what's the other one? App user data, endpoint, network, right? So those are kind of the core five. I mean, we understand the identity relationship to the endpoint, to the application, to the network, and probably some to some data access. So you are, I think, in, in, kind of covering all five of those core domains in some form or fashion, right? In some form or fashion, um, some more than others. I mean, identity isn't really our bag, to be perfectly honest, but all of the others very much are. Yeah, interesting. Rob, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. You're very welcome, Matt. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Jason. To learn how you can attain zero trust, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash threat locker. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. 